Hello friends today we are going to learn about the dating methods Dating methods or techniques are procedures used by scientists to determine the age of rocks fossils or artifacts There are two types of dating methods relative dating and absolute dating Relative dating methods tell only if one sample is older or younger than another while absolute dating methods provide an approximate date in years I have already covered the relative dating methods in my last video. The link is provided in the description box. In this video, we are going to learn about the absolute dating methods. First method is carbon dating or radiocarbon dating. It is a radioactive decay method of age determination. Let's first understand what is radioactive decay. Radioactive decay is the process by which an unstable atomic nucleus loses energy by radiation. A material containing unstable nuclei is considered radioactive. Three of the most common types of decay are alpha decay, beta decay and gamma decay, all of which involve emitting one or more particles or photons. Radiocarbon dating works by comparing the three different isotopes of carbon. Isotopes of a particular element have the same number of protons in their nucleus but different number of neutrons. This means that although they are very similar chemically, they have different masses. While the lighter isotopes C12 and C13 are stable, the heaviest isotope C14 is radioactive. Professor Willard Libby, a chemist at the University of Chicago, first proposed the idea of radiocarbon dating in 1946 most c14 is produced in the upper atmosphere where neutrons which are produced by cosmic rays react with nitrogen 14 atoms cosmic rays enter the earth's atmosphere and collide with an atom creating an energetic neutron when the neutron collides with a nitrogen atom a nitrogen 14 atom with seven protons and seven neutrons turns into a carbon 14 atom it is then oxidized to create c14 carbon dioxide which is dispersed through the atmosphere and mixed with c12 carbon dioxide and c13 carbon dioxide this carbon dioxide is used in the photosynthesis by plants and from here it is passed through the food chain every plant and animal in this chain including us will therefore have the same amount of 14c compared to 12c as the atmosphere when living things die tissue is no longer being replaced and the radioactive decay of carbon 14 becomes apparent if we know the c14 to c12 ratio at the time of death and the ratio today we can calculate how much time has passed The amount of C14 in the atmosphere and therefore in plants and animals has not always been constant. For instance, the amount varies according to how many cosmic rays reach earth. This is affected by solar activity and the earth's magnetic field. Luckily, we can measure these fluctuations in samples that are dated by other methods. From these records, a calibration curve can be built. Following death and burial, wood and bones lose C14 as it changes to nitrogen 14 by beta decay. Half-life of carbon 14 is 5730 years. Half-life of a radioactive substance is the time required for a quantity to decay to half of its initial value. It has proved to be a versatile technique of dating fossils and archaeological specimens from 500 to 50000 years old. There are some limitations of this technique. The farthest back C14 can be used is about 10 half lives or 57000 years. The second difficulty arises from the extremely low abundance of C14, making it incredibly difficult to measure and extremely sensitive to contamination. In the early years of radiocarbon dating, a product's decay was measured, but this required huge samples, for example, half of human femur. Many labs now use an accelerator mass spectrometer, a machine that can detect and measure the presence of different isotopes to count the individual C14 atoms in a sample. 
This requires less than 1 gram of bone, but few countries can afford more than 1 or 2 AMS, which can cost more than a 5 lakh dollar. They are out of reach for much of the developing world. In addition, samples need to be thoroughly cleaned to remove carbon contamination from glues and soil before dating. This is particularly important for very old samples. If 1% of the carbon in a 50,000 year old sample is from a modern contaminant, the sample will be dated to around 40,000 years. Potassium Argon Dating This method is also a radioactive method. Potassium is one of the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust, almost 2.4% by mass. Amongst its three isotopes, Radioactive potassium-40 is used for dating old volcanic rocks. From this, you can also date other types of rocks or fossils sandwiched between the layer of volcanic rocks. One out of every 10,000 potassium atoms is radioactive potassium. It has a half-life of 1.33 billion years, which further decays into argon-40 and calcium-40. Argon is a noble gas. So when it is embedded in something that is liquid, it just bubbles out. It's not bonded to anything. When volcano erupts, rocks are heated to the melting point. Any argon-40 contained in them is released into the atmosphere. This resets the amount of argon to zero. We are only going to left with potassium-40. That's why argon-40 is important because the calcium-40 not necessarily have seeped out but the argon-40 will seep out. So the volcanic events reset the amount of argon. When the rock crystallizes, it becomes impermeable to gas again. As the remaining potassium-40 in the rock decays into argon-40, the gas is trapped into the rock. For every one of the argon atom, you must have had about 9 calcium-40 atoms, as it's only 11% of the decay product. And for every one of these argon, there must have been 10 original potassium-40. So you can look at the ratio of the number of potassium-40 there are today to the number there must have been to actually date it. When you are able to put the two volcanic rock layers into chronology, then you will be able to find out the approximate date in years of the fossils embedded in between the two layers. There are some limitations of this technique. The technique works well for almost any igneous or volcanic rock, provided that the rock gives no evidence of having gone through a heating recrystallization process after its initial formation. This technique is most useful to archaeologists and paleontologists when lava flows or volcanic tufts form strata that overlie strata bearing the evidence of human activity. Materials dated using this method are not the direct result of human activity. It is crucial that the associations between the igneous or volcanic beds being dated and the strata containing human evidence is very carefully established. Potassium argon dating is accurate from 4.3 billion years to about 1 lakh years before present. At 1 lakh years, only 0.0053% of the potassium-40 in a rock would have decayed to argon-40, pushing the limits of present detection devices. Uranium dating is one of the oldest and most refined of the radiometric dating schemes. It can be used to date rocks that formed and crystallized from about 1 million years to over 4.5 billion years ago. The method is usually applied to zirconium. This mineral incorporates uranium and thorium atoms into its crystal structure, but strongly rejects lead when forming. As a result, Newly formed zircon deposits will contain no lead, meaning that any lead found in the mineral is radiogenic. Since the exact rate at which uranium decays into lead is known, the current ratio of lead to uranium in a sample of the mineral can be used to reliably determine its age. The method relies on two separate decay chains, the uranium series from uranium-238 to lead-206 with a half-life of 4.47 billion years.
the actinium series from uranium 235 to lead to not 7 with a half life of 710 million years fission track dating uranium in a crystal will damage the crystal structure as it decays the main mode of radioactive decay for the uranium 238 nucleus is alpha particle emission however about 1 in every 2 million decays is by nuclear fission let's first understand the difference between nuclear decay and nuclear fission radioactive decay is the spontaneous disintegration of heavier nucleus into a lighter one by the emission of alpha beta or gamma radiation whereas nuclear fission requires collision of nucleus with a subatomic particle nuclear fission chain reaction occurs until a stable nucleus is formed during fission the heavy unstable nucleus splits into two uneven positively charged fragments the two fragments are propelled in opposite direction from the reaction site dissipating their considerable excess kinetic energy in the host crystal lattice this interaction disturbs the crystal structure creating a single linear damage trail at the atomic scale the trails cannot be observed optically but because they are very reactive they can be enlarged with chemical agents to become visible under an optical microscope this radiometric method is often used to date crystals and glasses in volcanic rocks that have cooled quickly such as volcanic ash the commonest minerals dated using this method are zircon and apatite zircon is common in volcanic ash and its crystals contain very small amounts of the uranium 238 isotope as the fission takes place subatomic particles split away these particles leave tiny tracks in the crystal structure of the zircon the more tracks there are the longer the uranium has been decaying for let's see the limitations of this dating fission tracks are extremely thermally unstable the rock crystal will realign upon slight heating either erasing or greatly shrinking most fission tracks when the ash leaves the hot volcano its fission track clock is at zero therefore fission tracks can only date the age of the last cooling of the rock not necessarily the rock's correct geologic age of formation worm analysis worms are annual layers of sediments deposited at the bottom of the lakes by the runoff from the melting glacial ice this method is based on the measurement of the relative thickness of the worms as their comparison with other sections during the glacial periods when freezing takes place water does not flow and hence there is no sedimentation resulting in narrow bands in the core during winter seasons during the interglacial periods characterized by the warm climatic conditions the ice sheet melts the material gets deposited by a subglacial channel the seasonal variations are also reflected in the nature of the sediments being coarse or fine worm analysis is one of the oldest dating methods which demonstrate seasonal variations and also reflect the climatic conditions of ancient time The word worm in Swedish means annual layers of sediments deposited at the bottom of the lakes by the runoff from the melting glacial ice. Formation of worm depends on climatic variation. In summer, when ice melts, coarse sediments deposit at the bottom, and in winter, when the lake is frozen, the finer sediments deposit at the top. It is possible to measure the relative thickness of the worms and obtain a series to which one can compare and correlate new sections as they are discovered. There are some limitations of this method. The worms form only near ice and so in most parts of the world there are no worms. The melting of ice does not occur at uniform rates and may be deposited as worms more or less frequently than annually. Dendrochronology It is an absolute dating method based on the annual growth rings found in some species of trees. As each ring corresponds to an year, 
the age of the tree can be determined by counting the number of rings the pattern of rings and thickness between the rings varies based on rainfall and other environmental conditions like cloud cover moisture availability and temperature trees of same species of a single locality exhibit similar annual rings by overlapping these patterns with successively older trees master dendrochronology sequence can be prepared age of fossil trees can be found by comparing the sample with the master sequence on one ring we can see the cell of early wood which are large cells and thinner cell walls these cells form during the growth period of the ring cells in the latter wood have smaller cells with thicker cell walls and are formed during the summer typically the tree ring pattern repeats annually but not always oak trees are extremely reliable that is one growth ring equal to one year but alders and pines are not one growth ring equal to 0.2 years or can vary trees in tropical regions sometimes don't even have rings at all trees at margins of acceptable habitats that is species ideal habitat have the most variations in rings making it easier to make deduction about environment paleomagnetic dating after world war 2 geologists developed the paleomagnetic dating technique to measure the movement of the magnetic north pole over geologic time shifts in the molten core of the planet cause earth's magnetic field to vary in paleomagnetism rocks are dated based on the occurrence of reversals in earth's magnetic poles these types of pole reversals have occurred with irregular frequency every 100000 years or so in earth's history in the magnetic material the unpaired electrons in the atom produce a net magnetism when the magnetic material is heated it becomes liquid and the dipoles in them are free to orient themselves in the direction of the earth's magnetic field when these magnetic materials are cooled the atomic magnets are freezed to that position from this we can study the direction of the earth's magnetic field at that time in those regions as it is preserved in the cooled magnetic material a number of studies have shown that a record of past angles of dip and declination is trapped in baked clay the magnetic and hematite grains in the fired clay align with the magnetic field of the earth surrounding them geomagnetic north pole which guides compass drifts constantly at the rate of about 600 miles for every 100 years by finding out the path of the earth's magnetic field at the time when the clay sample was fired and by comparing it with the present magnetic direction the age of the sample in exact number of years can be calculated archaeomagnetic dating technique is very valuable for prehistoric anthropology partly because it gives absolute dates and partly because baked clay is present in most prehistoric sites the reliability of the method depends on the availability of good records of change of magnetic paths for areas of near prehistoric sites within a radius of about a maximum of 1000 miles to have such a material which has not been shifted from the place where it was first fired thermoluminescence dating Thermoluminescence can be used to date material containing crystalline minerals to a specific heating event. This is useful for ceramics as it determines the date of firing as well as for lava or even sediments that were exposed to substantial sunlight. These crystalline solids are constantly subjected to ionizing radiation from their environment which causes some energized electrons to become trapped in defects in the molecular crystal structure. An input of energy such as heat is required to free these trapped electrons. The heating must have taken the object above 500 degrees Celsius which covers most ceramics. The accumulation of trapped electrons and the gaps left behind in the spaces they vacated occurs at a measurable rate proportional to the radiation received from a specimen's immediate environment. When a specimen is reheated, the trapped energy is released in the form of light as the electrons escape. This is called as thermoluminescence. The amount of light produced is a specific and measurable phenomenon. If the specimen's sensitivity to ionizing radiation is known, 
as is the annual influx of radiation experienced by the specimen the released thermoluminescence can be translated into a specific amount of time since the formation of the crystal structure hence the age is calculated by the formula subsequently accumulated dose of ambient radiation divided by the dose accumulated per year the accumulation of trapped electrons begins with the formation of the crystal structure thermoluminescence can date crystalline materials to their date of formation for ceramics this is the moment they are fired as reheating the material resets the clock the major source of error is establishing dates from thermoluminescence in a consequence of inaccurate measurements of the radiation acting on a specimen the complex history of radioactive force on a sample can be difficult to estimate however thermoluminescence is proven acceptable in providing approximate dates in the absence of more exact measures so these were the absolute dating methods i hope these are clear to you now